لو قطعوا ارجلنا واليدين نأتيك زحفا سيدي يا حسين سيد المرسلين قاتل النبيين طه وياسين أحمد محمود أبو القاسم محمد ومن المحبين إطرة الطاحرين لانة الدائمين من الآن إلى يوم الدين على أعدائهم أما بعد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفركانه الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد خلقنا الإنسان في أحسن تقويم سلاحة ومني في الآس سبعين دايس وهبين on the topic of reflecting on a very important aspect that can, Muslim, can the Muslim Ummah reclaim its rightful place as a civilized force. <coughs> and to recap very briefly, we looked at the position, the makeup of societies and how societies move towards the path of progress and what are the models, like the model in Medina, for example, which allows us to look at a model of justice, a model where each human being was given his or her right within that society. And also we looked at that just as drops of the ocean come together and create waves, when human beings with upright characters, human beings with the value of compassion, human beings who support the concept of truth, and human beings who have all good attributes come together, like those drops in the ocean, they can bring about goodness in a society. And it is not a stick of kun fire kun that a leader or a ruler or a tyrant or a dictator, benign as he may be, would be able to make that change in that society. In Allah la yugayyil ma bi qawmin, hatta yugayyil ma bi anfusil. That Allah does not change the condition of a people unless they make that change within themselves. So we read that far, we talked about different concepts of critical thinking, we looked at the power of intentional living, living with a niya of being and having a vision. And we also talked about the value proposition of a human being. And we looked in some detail about the numerous aspects that where we would have the concept of the values of Karbala, of valor, understanding of Tawheed, understanding of truth and justice, the concept of social justice, standing up against the ego, and giving one's all in order to ensure that humanity forever remembers those words of Sayyidu Shahada Imam Hussain al-Islam when he said, Mithri la libayi mithlahu. He did not say that I will not make the way of Yazid, 
what he said was that the likes of me cannot pay allegiance to the likes of him, which means that this message was a universal message. And I quoted Sayyid Ustad Mutahari when he said that every drop or each single drop that rolls down your cheek, as you remember, the Shuhada of Karbala, if that drop is a drop of reflection, if that drop is a drop which is going to inspire me to follow the example of those who gave their lives in Karbala, then that gives us a flight, a flight, a spiritual flight, a spiritual elevation that nothing else can give us, which is a brief flight that our spirit makes along with the spirit of Hussein. This indeed is the entire thinking that we have been discussing in the last few days. Today, I'd like to develop this subject, which is a subject of the heart, Qalb al because everything else revolves around that emotion and the idea of what one may call to use the metaphor used about the swords in the beautiful Gujarati rendition and its equally powerful English translation to say that there is another level and this is a missile of the heart. It's a heart-to-heart -heart missile. And when you have that heart-to-heart -heart missile, being thrown out towards humanity, then there is connection between humanity. And we need to understand this concept of Qalb Salim, which is very much a Quranic concept, where we learn that within the Quranic concept, Bismillah rahman rahim وَلَا تُخِزْنِي يَوْمَ يَعْسُونَ يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَا عَطَاءَ اللَّهُ بِقَلْبِ السَّلِيمِ Truly, the translation of those verses are that disgrace me not on the day when they are raised, the day on which property will not avail nor sons, except him who comes to Allah with a heart free from evil, which is Qalb al-Salim. The ultimate change has to be within the human being. There needs to be a will to achieve this level of Kalbe Salim. What is this Kalbe Salim? We hear about it. It's a Quranic term. And many times we seem to have, and inshallah I'll come to that towards the end, but we seem to have the, left the Quran on the shelves. As Mahirul Qadri's poetry goes, Taqo me sadaya jata hum, Aakho se lagaya jata hum, Jab kolo karar ki nobat aate hai, Tab haatho pe uthaya jata hum. There is a beautiful poem by Mahirul Qadri in terms of the lament of the Quran, that kis baz me meri, us nahi, kis me fil me mera zikr nahi, Phir bhe me kitna akela rehta hum. This is the Quran. And we look at the Quranic concept of Qalb al and this is what the Quran teaches us about a heart that is free from evil. And Imam Jafar as sadiq has said that Qalb al is a heart, look at the beautiful words of Imam, let's ponder upon it, just reflect on it, which means Allah in a state where it only has Allah and nothing else. The pure emotion of that emptiness that we talked about, it is not just a society. Because even as a human being, we are in a state of chaos. 100 questions come to us, and we are loaded with preconceived ideas. So and so is such and such. That society is such and such. These are progressive Muslims. These are fundamental Muslims. These are grasshopper Muslims. These are that kind of Muslims. All kind of preconceived ideas that we have about ourselves. The, the point is, 
unless there is emptiness. You empty out the baggage that you accumulated all these years. Once that is emptied out and you allow that ruhani and that spirituality to enter, there is no injection of spirituality. It's a matter of opening up the heart. It's a matter of cleaning up the heart. It's a matter of cleaning up that mirror which has been full of dust that that spirituality enters and this is the meaning when Imam al Islam says that this is a heart, a kalbe salim is a heart where there is nothing but Allah in it. And that truly is the identification of a moment to say that this is it is filled with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if it is filled with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that truly is the maintenance of the concept of taqwa, because taqwa, as I said before, is not fear of Allah. He is not sitting up there with a huge big stick to say, I'm going to beat you up just because you did not do something. It is the love of Allah. It is that level of taqwa to say, Ya Allah, I love you so much and you love me so much, how can I be disobedient to you? How can I create a masya? That is the meaning of taqwa. It's God cognizance, saying that he is right, he is with me, he is closer to me than my judgmental reign. How can I possibly even think about disobeying you? Imam Ali al Islam was once asked to say, do you ever consider, would you ever consider Disobeying Allah. And he looks at the man and they were on the street and there was a sewer running with, with dirty water. And Imam said, would you ever consider drinking from that sewer? And, he, and the man says, no, never. How can I? He said, that is our feeling towards disobeying Allah. Mawini, this is the level of Qalbi Salim. This is the level of spirituality that we have. And indeed, when we talk about the journey of nafs, we talk about the human being who can go lowest of the low, lower than the animals, and the highest of the high, above the state of the angels. There is also a route that the nafs takes. If my akal is subjugated by kuwaya dhazabiyya and kuwaya akaliya, my passion and my desire, to be angry, my desire of anger, the faculty of anger, Zaza, and my akal is overpowered, that is also a state, in other words, of nafsi ammar. It is that animalistic self that takes me towards the passions of the animals. It takes me towards the ferociousness of animals. And if I cannot control it, if I cannot bring it into balance, then my nafs is at the level of Ammara, which is nafs Ammara. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me a beautiful faculty, which is the faculty of nafs al It is a self-blaming soul within me, which will bring me back to say, what you are doing is not right. What you are doing is unholy. What you are doing is incorrect. This is not that you are not with the truth. It's a self-blaming soul which is going to bring me back. And then I move on to that journey which is towards the journey of Qalb salim where you have what we call the nafs mutmainna a soul that is content. That is the least of the journeys that we might be able to take because there are other levels of nafs which only some can reach. We pray to Allah to give us tawfiq to at least reach towards nafs mutmainna But people can reach and those Aymali Muslim have taught us that you reach the state of nafs razia where you are pleased with whatever state Allah keeps you in, your soul is happy. And then there is a level even further and this was the state of the Shuhada of Karbala, particularly Imam Hussain al-Islam, you call this the nafs marziya This is a level where Allah is pleased with you. Indeed, to go from nafs ammara all the way to nafs marziya is 
a journey, a journey of nafs. And this is the basis upon which we understand the concept of Kalmasali. What is Kalm? It's interesting because the Arabic language is beautiful in terms of how certain words are brought into it to say the root, the root word is Kalaba, which means to turn and to rotate. The word Kal comes from Kalaba. And the only thing that pivots around the Creator which connects a human being in the seen and the unseen augmenting akal and intellect is truly the heart. And as I will try and show during this session that there is also a scientific basis when we talk about the heart that the heart has a memory of its own. It is not only the brain that thinks and we will go through that inshallah but this is something that is rotating and therefore when we talk about the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we talk about this idea of tatma'inna al-qulub, ala bi dhikrillahi, tatma'inna al-qulub. When you talk about it, then now surely by Allah's remembrance are the hearts at rest. It is that heart that is revolving around the maker. That is the meaning of spirituality as we understand it. In order to understand this better, of course, one can do no better than quote the Imam of Salaam as to how they have explained these concepts to us. And Imam Muhammad Bakr al Islam explains that there are four kinds of hearts. And what are those four kinds? The first one, he says, is a heart that has both faith and hypocrisy in it. This is a diseased heart that is neither fully healthy, nor is it dead yet. It's got everything in it. There are signs of hardness in it, but there are also some bases of some softness in it. And Imam says if that heart keeps committing more sins without repenting from them to block the spots on the heart, dead spots, then they will cover the whole heart and the heart will be dead. And Molana Rum gives a beautiful simile about the idea of the small sins and the combination of small sins that we think are small sins. And you know, we are so thick oriented. You know, Gunai Sagira, Gunai Kabira. I think I can get away with Gunai Sagira. And then Gunai Kabira is obviously a big thing, but Sagira, you know, the concept is the purity of the heart. And when Arun says, take a bramble bush. I don't know, we have bramble bushes in California in the desert. Uh, I don't know whether you have bramble bushes, but these are thorny bushes. It's a bramble bush. And when that bush is small, that's growing, when Arun says, you can pick, pluck it out and throw it away, and it will not block your path. But you allow it to grow, to six feet and if you don't do anything with it, quickly it grows into six foot and eight foot and it becomes a barrier to your path towards goodness and say, now you can't pluck it out. It's very difficult. You may have to bring a bulldozer to pick it up, but you cannot do it on your own. And Rumi says that those are the bases that you start collecting small sins, small bits of disobedience, and they start collecting. And you say, well, these are small. And they accumulate. And they grow. And they start working on you like this bramble bush. That there comes a time that when you do it first time, this happens to all of us. You do something that you're not supposed to do the first time. It really bugs you. The second time you do it, God forbid, you have repented. And our idea of repenting is to pet the two chicks and it's gone away. And then I do it again. And then I repent again. And then I do it again. The bramble bush is growing. Because these are the collection. And you know the nafsa lawama, the first time it's the strongest. It tells you do not do it. And the second time it says little slowly do not do it. 
And then the feeble wor words and this voice, inner voice of the Nafs and Lawama becomes even feeble, more and more feeble, and finally it completely stops because that disobedience has now become a habit, it has become my disposition, and if it's become my disposition, then I'll continue doing it, I will not even realize it until I move on to the next sin and then Nafs and Lawama will start again. But that has now been accepted in my system. My system does not react to it because it's part of my system. This is the meaning to say that these are those hearts that Imam says if that heart keeps committing more sins without repenting, the black spots on the heart will cover it and it will take you to the heart which is dead. And then Imam says that there is a second kind of a heart and that is an inverted heart which is upside down. What does it mean? It perceives things inverted. It sees everything upside down. The world is more important than the hereafter. Malam Mutikan Ali ibn Abi Talib was asked, What are the signs of the people of intellect, the people of art? He said numerous things. One of them he said was, it's so simple and yet it makes sense. He said, Earn. For here, to the degree that you're going to live on this earth and earn for Akhira to the degree that you're going to live in the hereafter. Now, it, it depends on our perception, which is longer, here or hereafter, which is more important, here or hereafter. And that is the meaning in terms of the heart that Imam says is a heart which is inverted and upside down. And then he said there is this heart which is sealed and darkened. The gathering of all the things within the heart, the malice, the deceit, every quality that is abhorred by good people, every quality that is abhorred by all faiths. And you know, in terms of bad qualities, Muslims don't hold a monopoly. All faiths have the same values. The values of justice, as opposed to injustice, the value of humanity, as opposed to zulm and tyranny, and so on and so forth. And the solid heart is incapable because now it is totally filled with all those things. It's incapable of benefiting from the remembrance of Allah except in the call towards His message. And when it is alluded in the Holy Quran to say that we will give tawfiq, and we will guide us to those that we will is indeed on the basis that these are the people whose hearts are open and not those whose hearts have been closed. And this is a meaning of the third kind of a heart. And then Imam says that there is the fourth kind of a heart which is clear and luminous. He called it Al-Azhar. It is a heart that has a likeness of a lamp. The heart that is luminous is that one of a believer who is thankful when God gives him and is patient when subjected to tribulation. It is a heart that is clear and luminous. This is the way towards Qadr Salim Salawat. I don't know about the U.S. I don't know about Canada, but in the U.S., in a recent poll, 7 out of 10 respondents were totally stressed about their economic crisis. You know, we went through this meltdown. In the U.S., our 401ks actually became 101k and less. The consequences actually extend far beyond trying to meet the family budget. Your banks were much more careful than our banks. And they didn't buy those instruments that they were not supposed to buy. And we are still suffering from it. And your government was much more clever not to find weapons of mass destruction where they did not exist. We were not so smart. Anyway, the consequences extend far beyond the family budget. When you have, for example, this is just an example. When you have the economic crisis within the nation, within a family, and within a society to say there is tension, more divorces, more broken homes, 
the jobless rate would be at a you know, new high, a global economic turndown, the mortgage crisis, the threat of layoffs, and all that. And what sets in is a tremendous degree of pessimism in a society. And then what happens? That we all need, we are part of this society. We can't escape some of the trials and tribulations. So the idea would be that there needs to be that aspiration to reach towards a positive internal dialogue which comes out of a heart which is open, a heart that is trying to reach the level of Qalb Salim. And it's Khalil Gibran who said, looking at the rose tree, one can see the rose and not its thorns. And the pessimist stares at the thorns, oblivious of the rose, because in any calamity, in any adversity, there is positivity. It's a matter of the state of mind to try and have a heart that is a positive heart. And then when we are in those strife, when we have that, and we all go through periods of difficulties, and the Blessed Prophet Islam wasallam, said, check your blessings. He said, whoever is not thankful with a little will never be thankful with a lot. Man was walking and, and he was really depressed. He didn't have any shoes. He couldn't afford to buy shoes. Until Mullah Rum says, he saw a man with no legs and he thanked Allah to say, at least I have legs that I can walk with. It is that level of saying, check your blessings. And then there is so much need for that peace, the inner peace. This is what the entire humanity needs. More than ever when you see the strife around us. And truly, that is something that means that we have to go towards that aspect of itminan, the Holy Quran exhorts us to evolve our understanding of itminan from a mere physical pleasure and temporary satisfaction and gratification and emphasizes the spiritual dimension within us. As I keep saying, no injection of spirituality. It's a matter of training. It's a matter of practice that we have. That is the ultimate manifestation of the itminan. And if we were truly to go back to the original word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the number of verses that we have that talk to us about tranquility, about inner peace, then we will say that we are truly blessed. And But this needs practice. These are mere words. Unless we put that into practice. And when that manifestation is attained with qalb salim a spirit, a heart that is at peace, you reach a stage of nafs mutmainna where you are pleased with your situation and you will be going towards a level of being pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the concept of qalb salim You know, the Holy Quran has numerous pointers to us when we look at cardiology. Now, I want to preamble this by saying something that needs to be understood when you are critical thinkers. I'll go through the next few slides and we'll look at science and we'll look at the concept of the heart and we look at what the Quran says. But the idea must be that what we are doing is we are validating science with Quran, not the other way around. You know, we sometimes get this from our presentations and our majalises and our podiums. To say, well, there is embryology in the Quran. And look, this is what science says today. And therefore, since science is saying it today, therefore Quran must be right. That is warped thinking. That is a heart which is overturned. One has to think on the basis that the Quran is the word of God. The Quran is correct. And therefore, if science aligns with it, therefore science must be correct. That is the thinking that we need to have 
not the other way around, that we have greater belief in, in, in the Quran because now we believe science. It should be the other way around. But this is just something to share that there are some facts about the heart that we talk about. For example, the scientists tell us that the vital role of the heart in understanding and realizing there is a, and, and there is a long presentation on this. We are interested, you know, I can email this, the whole presentation to you. This is very, very brief. But the idea is that science tells us that there is a level of memory in your heart. That there are messages being sent by the heart to the brain so that we have certain emotions. Also, there is a brain in your intestine. When you say, I have a gut feeling, for example, it, it, there is some, some meaning, there is some truth to it. So there is a brain also in your intestine. The body is not made of machines as Descartes wanted us to believe. The body is a universe in itself which needs to be understood. Every part is connected to the other and therefore removing one part and replacing it with a machine may save lives, but there is an emotional element. There is a whole equilibrium that needs to be done. And here, the heart is a realization center of the human body and we are told that science now has some validation to say that there are memory cells. And the, when the brain is dead and if something happens, the heart still can remember. And there are messages being sent. They confirm that each cell in our heart is considered to be a warehouse of events and information. And this is when the Quran says that Allah might test what is in your breast and to examine closely whichever was in your hearts and Allah is the all-knower and what is in your, in your breast. This is, you know, in the Quran. And science actually tells that there are memory cells within the heart. Isn't it amazing that the heart is created before the brain and it starts to pulse from its first day till death? So the heart precedes the brain. There must be a reason in creation for the heart to come first. And then when you look at that, that the heart is more than just a pump. For many years, scientists have studied the heart from a physiological perspective and considered it only a blood pumping machine. But when you have transplantation and heart surgeries, researchers started to notice a change in the patient's psychological status after the transplantation. And there are some instances which are anecdotal. So I know there's a scientific community sitting here and they may, not want, they may want to have a double-blind placebo trial and whatever there is, but there is anecdotal evidence that a grandfather who had a heart transplant actually lost all the feeling for the grandchildren. This is something that has been shown anecdotally not once, numerous times. That means that there is a level of memory in the heart. And then when we look at the heart, that it's more than just a blood pumping machine, it is said that it contains a sophisticated network of neurons that secrete the hormones that control the entire body. It can remember, feel and control emotion. Its signals change according to the emotional status of the heart. And it is true, do we not get a feeling? There is a sinking feeling in our heart if something is going to happen. There is not a sinking feeling in our brain. You get the sinking feeling in your heart deep in your stomach perhaps. Well, it could be the intestine, it could be your heart that is sending messages to your brain. And, and there is research. I don't want to, you know, uh, take up too much time. If you want to study this, it's there. There is a lot of information on this. But sure, especially in psychiatry at the Arizona University. And uh, Russia, they both believe that the heart has a special power which enables it to store and process information and therefore memory is not only in the brain but also in the heart. And this goes on and therefore moving in the Quran for us 
gives us so many different pointers. This is a book of wisdom. It talks about concepts like Kalbe Salih. There are many concepts. This is a book of wisdom which is sufficient for a man to raise himself from the abyss of material degradation to the sublime heights of the heavenly grace and eternal peace if only we believed it. If only we put that Quran to use, Mu'mineen, because this is a guidance from Allah. It is Allah's mercy for those of us who are trying to seek and trying to achieve goodness in our life on this earth. In our daily routine, in the busy lives that we lead, sometimes we tend to forget the source of all wisdom. And then we get distracted by small issues that give us so much heartache, excuse the pun, but it gives us so much heartache with small things that we forget the higher things that we are blessed with. In Hadith Al-Qudsi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and look at this, that you have taken my book and placed it under your feet. And you have taken this world and placed it over your head. This is an inverted heart. When we do our amal on Shabbat Qadr, physically we put the Quran on our head to signify that we obey the word of the Creator. But in our deeds, we follow this Hadith Al-Qudsi, that we place it under our feet and take the world and put it our head. I meaning that is the meaning of spirituality and Qalb Salim as to where we can. So here is a little point that I'd like to share with you. And the English translation is there. I will try and read the, the Urdu because it's much more beautiful. But you can read, I hope you can read. In ornament do they adorn me? Yes, they keep me and sometimes kiss me. In the celebrations they recite me. In the disputes they swear by me. The Urdu couplet goes, Taako me sajaya jata hoon, Aakho se lagaya jata hoon, Taaviz banaya jata hoon, that is a lament of the Quran. Just tara tote mainako, just tara tote mainako, kuch bol sikhaye jate hain, is tara padaya jata hu, is tara sikhaye jata hu. Again, we have it here. On share to the security, keep me till another celebration or dispute when they need me. Yes, they read me and memorize me. Yet only an ornament am I. No lessons do they take from me. No custom do they abandon from me. These slogans of devotion, these vows of dedication, these are lies, lies, for shallow are their utterances. My message lies neglected, my treasure untouched. The field lies bare, where blossomed once true glory. We're talking about the glory of the Muslims. We have lost the Quran. Wrong is the treatment that I receive. So much to give I have, but none is there to perceive. This is the Holy Quran and the treatment that we met out to the Holy Quran. Mawinin, it was for this Quran. Thank you. Salawat. <coughs>
whose hearts are so full of other things that we don't have space for the Qur'an for us. Tonight, we remember that valiant brother of Imam Hussain al-Islam. Abu al-Fazl, as he is called, the father of virtue, or Abu al-Qirba, literally, the father of the water skin, since he will try to bring water from the Furad to quit the thirst of those who were with the Imam. He was also called Kamar Bani Hashim, the moon of the Hashemites, a title that was given to him by his father, Imam Ali al-Islam, as he unveiled Abbas's face to the enemy at the time of the battle in Sifiri. Mawinin, that is the Abbas that we come here to remember tonight. There are many myths that happen in the Masai that we recite, especially on this night of the 8th. I'm sorry, I will not be able to recite those myths because Shaykh Ustad Muthari said, that if you recite some of these, if you are fasting, your fast will become bad. Many myths have been created. But it is enough, Mumini, for us to look at the personality of Abbas ibn Ali, to lament and to have a soft heart so that we can mourn about Abdullah. The historians have described it in the following words, and every one that I have is referenced, this is in Kibrit al ahmar where the historians have described that he was a lofty mountain with a momentous heart because he was a gallant knight and a fearless lion. Daring in the face of attacks and striking swords off to the non-believers in the field. That is what Abbas was. The very word Abbas actually means there is a level of firmness. It expresses his firmness and steadfastness in the face of evil. That is the spirit of Abbas. And this is what we need to understand. That Abbas ibn Ali's wonderful attributes and fearless nature was indeed a result of what he had inherited from his parents. It was the day of Ashur. When he comes to Imam and these words are authentic words quoted to say, that, oh brother, my heart has become constricted and I have grown tired of life. Allow me, allow me to avenge the blood of the martyrs. But Imam, for reasons best known to the Imam, we cannot be in the mind of Imam Hussain al Islam. And there are many riwayats which talk about what Imam Hussain said, which are totally false. Moment. But here, perhaps, what Imam said was the reality and the truth and the actual narration is the law of Abbas, before you do that, go fetch some water for those thirsty children. And Hazrat Abbas goes, he bids farewell to Imam, he looks up on the sky and it is said, and these were being recorded to say, Ya Allah, I wish to fulfill my oath of bringing water for the thirsty children. He kisses the forehead of Imam and goes towards the, the Euphrates. And indeed, if we remember that he was the standard bearer. In the early of the history of Islam, the standard bearers enjoyed a very important status, almost as important as the commander in chief. And therefore, a lot rested on the shoulder of the standard bearer Abbas. He was to lift the morale of the army and direct them to victory. But Mominin, where was that army that could be directed? Everybody had laid their lives. And it was now Abbas who kept the standard for Imam Hussein, and yet he held the standard, the alam high until the final moment. Abbas even managed to secure the standard, as we know that his arms were being severed by the, by the enemy from his elbows. Finally, he embraces the standard to his chest, and once again he advances towards the adversaries who had surrounded him in all the directions. He persisted in keeping the standard from failing to the ground. This was a standard of truth that Abbas was holding. This continued unless his blessed head was struck with a metal pole, and it split open, and Abbas falls to the ground, and so does the standard. Moving in every, oh, every warrior, this needs to be imagined that perhaps 
perhaps every warrior who is shot by an arrow can try and remove it or remove it from their body. Abbas faces 4,000 bowmen who had made him his only target for the arrows while the hand, his hands lay cut. This was a way every rider above me imagined that upon dismounting from his horse he is able to place his hand on the saddle on the other side. How could Abbas, how could Abbas place those hands because he had no hands? Mominin imagined that every warrior from his mount stretches his arm to the ground to prevent his head and body from crashing onto the ground. How could Abbas have done that without his arms? Indeed, Abbas was covered with arrows as he fell, as he fell from the horse. And at this fall, the arrows, the arrows further penetrated into his blessed body. And here he calls out Imam Hussain. Imam Hussain comes and says, Oh brother, oh Abbas, oh soul of my heart, oh for the destruction after you, oh Abbas, Oh Abbas, now back, my back has been broken. My means of release have been devastated and my, and my hopes have been cut short. When uh, Hazrat Abbas was seen to cry to say, Oh brother, why do you cry? Imam Hussain asked to say, Oh my brother, oh light of my eyes, how could I not cry when I see you holding my head in your lap and I know that in a while there will be no one to lift your head from the ground place it in his lap and clean the dust from your face. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Matala Hussain. On the plains of Karbala You said with a heart so scarred Hal min nasiri yansurna Who can help me in time so hard Falling from the cot to the floor Ali Asghar gave this call I will come crawling to you Hussain I will come crawling to you Hussain